Slack and you made your welcome you to the My Type of Hype podcast, where we celebrate hip hop, not just the hype. How y'all feel out there? Oh yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the My Type of Hype podcast. As always, me, your boy Slack, in the building. My co-host extraordinaire over to my left in the building. What's happening, brother? Very good, man. We're here. My Type of Hype, the podcast that celebrates hip-hop but not just the hype. Slack's in the house. E-Major's in the house. And as you can see, we've got a very special guest with us today, man. Very special. Um, RJ Payne's producer. Um, dope producer, produced for so many people. As you can see, P.A. Dre in the house. What's good, bro? How are you, man? Peace, brothers. How y'all doing? I'm good, man. I'm happy to be here. Nice, yeah, nice, man. nice. Welcome, 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 man. Big moment to have P.A. Dre on the show. P.A. Dre has been, man, one of my favorite producers for a minute now. Um, not only the stuff that he's done for R.J. Payne, but his own albums too, but we'll get onto that. Mm. Uh, the Pillmatic stuff, absolutely dope. But um, welcome to the show, bro. Yeah, man. thanks for having me here. So, pleasure, so pleasure, pleasure. As uh, with, with our usual uh, interview format, um, we'll ask a question, ask a question, he'll ask a question, and then we'll just keep it rolling like that. Um, okay. mm. Anything that you have to plug and let the people know about what you're getting up to, we'll put it at the bottom of the chat so anyone that interacts can find your music if they haven't heard you or hear some more stuff that they might not have, have heard before they learned about this this interview. So. Thanks for coming on, man. And the people are definitely going to love what's coming up that, that you got in the can. But we'll talk about that. Uh, as yeah, 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 most definitely. <laughs> most definitely. So, um, E, man, fire off, man. Yeah, man. So we'll get straight into it. We'll ask you some questions, give you an opportunity at the end, obviously, to plug what you want to plug. And hopefully we'll get to know you a bit more throughout the questions, man. So as we know, you're a dope producer, man. You know, you drop a lot of heat and have done for a long period of time, man. Um, so I want to ask you, you just... How did you get into hip hop, man? What's your like your earliest earliest memory of hip hop? Um, what would you say introduced you to this to this thing we love, man? Oh man, um, I would say my older brother. Like one of my, I got three older brothers, but mm -hmm. one of my older brothers. Um, that's that's who pretty much introduced me to hip hop. Um, he's much older than me, and you know he used to play certain stuff around the house. And obviously, I was like really young, but you know, I I like what I was hearing, and um, I grew up in a musical household. Like my my grandfather and my dad, they were like they played a lot of uh, really important songs and stuff with a lot of famous people before I was even born. And so when I I was growing up, uh, I was really originally born in Memphis, Tennessee. And my dad was like one of the best drummers in Memphis. And he used to play with Shaka Khan, Isaac Hayes. And wow. uh, like my granddad, uh, he put my, my granddad plays the, the hi hat on the Shaft theme song. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's my granddad playing the hi hat. And then oh, he's playing the hi hat on that. And um, mm. and then my, my dad, he played the percussion for um, a song by. A singer called Anita Ward, and the song was called "Ring My Bell." Like you can ring my yeah. bell. Yeah, yeah, that's my dad playing the percussion on that, and oh, wow. uh, he, he played the percussion on the SOS band "Take Your Time," and a bunch of other stuff. So, like I said, growing up, I, it was the music was natural for me because it's what I saw. You know what I mean? But as far mm -hmm. as with hip hop, you know, my older brother, he was the one that kind of introduced that to me. Um, even though he wasn't supposed to at the time, it was like certain <laughs> songs. Like um, I, I remember him getting a whooping when I was young because he, he played. He, he played. Uh, what's what was the salt and pepper? The the the, the push it. Yeah, push it. Yeah. Right. So my parents they they figured you know what the song was talking about. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't want my brother to let me listen to that. And one day they left him with me to babysit. And the video was on the TV, and he let me watch it. And he just so happened to walk in the house while it was on TV, and you. We <laughs> <laughs> so it was that. Like I was listening to that. Uh, to, well, I had that's how I kind of got introduced to it. And but then when I got older, a little older, it was still the same as far as me sneaking to listen to certain things. And that mm -hmm. was um, Dr. Dre, The Chronic. When that came, mm -hmm. like I was listening to like MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice. 
because yeah. I was I was a kid, so it was like exactly. that was okay yeah. for me to listen to. But then I was hearing like I was hearing like what Dr. Dre was doing with the Chronic album, and it was just like it was just something unlike anything I had ever heard before. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't old enough to purchase it myself, so there was a kid in my neighborhood. Um, I remember one time he had he had it on a tape. And he asked to borrow my bike and said, yo, if you let me borrow your bike, I'll let you borrow this tape. And to be quite honest with you, I didn't care if he came back with the bike or not. <laughs> the tape even though he did, I kind of didn't even want him to come back for the bike, for the you tape. I mean, the album. Yeah. The tape and good, so, yeah. so I would be sitting, I had the Walkman and I had the tape and I'll be sitting in the living room with my family, they don't know what I'm listening to. They're thinking I'm listening to MC Hammer or something like that, <laughs> Batman soundtrack or something. And the whole yeah, time man. I'm listening to that, you know, so that's pretty much like my earliest uh, introduction to uh, to hip hop. That's so dope, man. I love hearing about people's intros because however different they are, there's a little bit of the same thread Ooh, that runs through. So with E, it was his big sister. With me, it was mm. my, my dad and my uncles. And it was pretty much the same kind of thing. Like I got chased around the house um, by my mom when I was listening to the Back the Fuck Up album by Onyx. Um, right. She heard a one line in there and she went crazy. Like she was chasing me around the house. <laughs> had to run outside. She was like, Don't ever play that in this house. Yeah. That. So See, my brother, he would bring me tapes and stuff. Cause he, like I said, he was much older. So he was out in the streets mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And he'll come to the house and he'll like leave tapes and stuff with me. That's even how I got introduced to Wu Tang, which was my older brother. Okay. He'd like, right. he bring me tapes and stuff. And was like, Yo, listen to this. This is what's hot right now. And I'll be in my mm -hmm. room. With my little boombox checking it out with my headphones on and stuff. Same, same, same story, man. But you said that you was you, you came up in Memphis, man. That's really interesting to me because when you think about people like Primo, um, there's a, a lot of things that kind of a lot of artists kind of started in the south. I think even Jada Kiss was saying that he was he was down there before he moved to New York. There was a lot mm -hmm. of artists that kind of came up around sort of Memphis, that kind of area, Mississippi and then they kind of migrated out to different parts yeah. of the states of the east coast and stuff right. so growing up in that kind of environment like there seemed to be a lot more kind of musicality like a lot of people played instruments and they were in bands yeah. they were singers yeah. so that was influencing like a lot of people so right. coming up around that like is that what made you want to become a producer because you were around so much just good like rich music well um I could say yeah and no at the same time. I would say yeah because of my father. Because I was so young. I was probably like six, like six or mm. seven when I moved to Pennsylvania. Mm. But when I was in Memphis, I, I was around music. All It was the bands practicing in my living room. Right. Isaac Hayes and all types of people would just be in my living room. That's crazy. And they'd be practicing, and this is what I saw. My dad would sit me on his lap and let me practice with the drums and you know, all that. So it was just it was just quite quite natural that I did want to do something musically. But as far as um you know, getting into the production, that came a little like later by the time I had I was living in Pennsylvania at the time. Right, okay. So that's I was thinking it was just naturally from, there though. That's where PA comes from in your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah Pennsylvania. Right. Pennsylvania, and then Dre. Obviously, my name's Andre. So, which was funny because, um, if you guys don't mind, yeah, um, of course. So my name used to be Midas Touch. That was my name, like maybe over twenty years ago, mm. and I had I ended up moving to Atlanta for a while, and I was going to the, to this barber shop. And there was this guy that worked in the barbershop. I was going in the barbershop to get my smoke. i am be honest with you, right? I would get my hair cut too, but it's also where I would get my smoke from. And so yeah. there was a barber that worked in there, and his name was Dre. And so when I came in the barbershop, you know, people got familiar with me. They are like, oh, that's P.A. Dre is here, like from Pennsylvania. They knew I was from right. Pennsylvania. Uh, and so every yeah. time I, I, I would come there, they would always be like, oh, yeah, that's P.A. Dre from, you know what I mean? And it kind of stuck with me and I kind of looked at it like, you know, I kind of wanted to change my name because I always wanted to have my actual name yeah, as a part name. of my, yeah, as a part of my name, you know what I mean? But I'm like, well, there's Dr. Dre already, there's Andre 3000 already, there's like, it's, you know what I mean? So I'm just like, how can I make this work 
So at the time, I, I didn't see a way to make, make it work. But anyway, so, you know, like I said, with the PA Dre situation, I started to look at it like, you know, um, no matter where I go, you know, I, I represent where I'm from. And so that's why I was just like, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm bringing PA with me no matter where I'm at. So I'm in Atlanta at the time and I'm bringing the PA vibes with me. So I just looked at it like, yo, PA Dre, I'm going to let's I'm going to rock with that because, it, you know, it means where no matter where I'm at, like for now, like I live in California now and my, mm-hmm. my friends and stuff, they, they joke with me. You know, we're going to start calling you C.A. Dre now? I'm just like, no, <laughs> no. I'm like, that's the purpose of the P.A. It's like, no matter where I'm at, I'm still representing, you know what I mean? I'm still bringing mm-hmm. the vibes from the home, that's you know cool. what I mean? So all the places that you've lived, why did P.A. Uh, stick with you that much more? Was it because of the years that you came up in P.A.? Yeah, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Right. Right. So, and, and it's like Memphis, I, I would still, like, travel back and forth to um, visit family and stuff. Um but I, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and then as far as with me moving to Atlanta or any of those other places came, like, far after I was, like, an adult. You know? Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, It's interesting, man. So you're speaking about coming up and, you know, the, the music in your family. You spoke about the Isaac Hayes, you know, those type of influences. You heard the Chronic and different hip-hop albums and sort of had the introduction and the transition into hip-hop. And then you obviously got into producing. What I've noticed about your style is that it varies. You know, a lot of producers have their own sort of style and their own tag that you always know that's a primo beat or, you know, that's a whoever yeah. beat, that's a that beat. Yeah. I don't feel that you have that, which isn't which isn't a good or a bad thing. I think it's actually quite good because it means that you can vary your style. Because when you listen to your beats, a lot of your beats, right, you can have that dark undertone feel to it. You know what I mean? Like something dangerous is going to happen. But right. then, like, you listen to <laughs> some of your most recent productions, like on the... um. On Payne's new project, My Life is a Movie 2, you look at mm-hmm. songs like South Street, uh, Uptown, Saturday Night, North Philly, you know, they're bright. You see what I'm saying? Like right. a lot of your music as well, it makes a transition from a dark sounding sound right up to a bright one. You know what I mean? Almost mm-hmm. from like a Havoc to an Apollo Brown type. It varies. Right. Right. How would you how would you describe your style? Is that something you do intentionally? Yeah, because so I want to OK, first and foremost, Musically, I didn't start out as a producer. Okay, I started out as a rapper. Okay, but right. then I, but I can, we can give that backstory, or whatever, at, at any point in this, this interview. I was actually going to ask you a question about that. So we we'll go back to that. Yeah, so that I started out that as a rapper, but mm-hmm. um, so as as far, but I was producing and rapping at the same time. And producing has always been like my passion and my love, but I started out doing both. But um, so the funny thing is this, right? When you asked me about the sound, um, I did. I did used to have a sound, you know, mm. and I started to think. I'm like, I don't want to be that, right? You know, I don't want to be that guy that has that one sound. Mm. Mm. I want to be Quincy Jones, right? Mm. You know, I, that's what I want. I don't want to be. I don't. Cause I look at it like. Like, for, I've always prided myself on being versatile, right? Yeah. And um, and it's like, I look at it like, you know, and this is no shot or anything to anybody that does have that specific sound yeah. or whatever like that. But I look at it like uh, being a mechanic and you only know how to change tires. Mm. The only Very time true. you're going to get a call is when somebody needs their tires changed. Very true. Versus mm. learning how to fix a whole car. And so if anybody need anything done, mm. they call you for, for whatever. Right. And I noticed like once I adapted that mentality, doors, so many doors opened up for me because I was able to do so many different things. It's like, okay, mm. you can't like, it ain't, you can't just put me in the box to just do this one thing. You know what I mean? Mm. Then yeah, plus I listen, like I like a lot of different type of stuff. You know, like a lot of different types of music and things like that. So, you know, I mean, at, at some point in my career, I was I was talking to my oldest son uh, the other day because he's you know, started getting into the music world, and mm-hmm. um, and I was even I was saying like how like he right now like he's seventeen years old, he's working on an eighties themed project like that sounds like it's mm-hmm. from the eighties, and I was just like, yo, that's nice. dope, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I was just you know because I was I was applauding the fact that. You know, 
he allows his, himself to be versatile and he don't want to be put in a box, which the apple don't fall too far from the tree. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so it's like with me, at some point I want to I want to do rock music. I want to do so I just want to do so many different things. I don't want to just just do the rap thing forever. Like right now I'm getting into scoring uh, film and documentaries right. and stuff like that. So, mm. you know, but as far as the, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm probably like veered off from what you asked me a little bit. Nah, <laughs> nah, I just started to get really detailed. But, That's uh, what we like, man. We're good. but yeah, so yeah. basically to answer your question, yeah, it's on purpose that I don't just stick with one sound, you know? Yeah. You, you've you've yeah. done it though, man. Like I said, listening to your music, I don't think you can really pull out and say that's PA Dre. That's and I think that's a good thing. Do you know what I mean? Because it, unless it's you hear my unless you point. hear my my tag at the beginning of it, that's right, how you yeah. know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you, no, you like, kind of see that with other producers, don't you? Where they start out and you're like, yeah, I can pinpoint that sound, but then mm -hmm. they get to a point in their career where they're like, I don't want to be defined by just that sound, or I don't just want to do hip hop. Like you see yeah. people like. Andre 3000, where he was doing a lot of producing for Outcast, or they were doing it as Earth Tone 3. Mm. Then he gets to the um the double album, the Love Below, or whatever. That's that was complete yeah. 180 from what he was doing with Outcast. Because right. I think a lot of artists get to that point where they're like, I just don't want to just be that guy who's just done this. I want right. to this, this is the this. thing. What a lot of people don't know is that's like when you when you have that sound, that one sound. You put yourself on the clock. Right, exactly that. 100%. 100%. You know what I mean? Because at exactly. some point, people are going to get tired of that sound. And now right. you're not 100%. hot anymore because right. you only had that. Yeah, yeah, you only had that, that one specific thing you can do. Right. Mm. And I think 100%. what's killing a lot of producers now, and I've, I've said this a few times on Twitter, is they're not influenced by anything but other rap or other hip hop music. Right. The good thing is that you you just said you're influenced by so many other genres of music yeah. that will allow you to expand your sound because you've got other genres to pull from. So if you right. want to go into rock or soul or electro or whatever, you can do that because you've been inspired and influenced since the right. Because on a, on a day to day, like when I'm actually right. like I work on so much music, rap music and stuff. Like right, right. now, I'm producing like three R and B projects. But right. um, mm. you know, just on a regular, on a day to day, when I'm actually like listening to music, I'm listening to stuff like Nina Simone and like right. you know, Blind Melon and just you know, different. I'm listening to different things, you know. Yeah, because yeah. your mind yeah. is gonna pull from the, like the greatest hip hop for me is the stuff that I pulled from. Like we had the whole jazz rap scene. Yeah, right. Was coming up, you know what I mean with the brand right. new being and all of that kind of stuff. We've had a little bit of rock with Onyx and stuff like that. That some of that was dope. So we had have other genres like influencing parts of it. We had like yeah. reggae at one point. A lot of artists yeah, were doing reggae. Jamaican kind of influence songs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Right. Now it just feels like all we're doing is like taking from songs that were hot ten years ago and trying. Oh to man, them, you know? Yeah, I I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I it's hear it man. right now. There's no like influence it's just i'm gonna remake that song i'm not gonna like take a piece of it and try and make yeah it it, it, it it comes across as a bit uh lazy yeah of course bro. yeah super mm. lazy definitely so tell us mm. tell us how you started as a rapper man um yeah so i started as a rapper i was what's how old was uh i think i was about eight about eight or nine years old Mm -hmm. And um, you know, me and my me and my, my my right hand man, my best friend at the time, uh, there was these old there was these older kids that was at this park. And it was like a contest, and uh, there was people like like news people was there, and it was a big thing at this park. And you know, me and my me and my friend, we were standing there and we was watching it. Who was watching these kids that you know that, that we knew from around the way, although they were older than us, we was watching them rap and you know do this contest or whatever like that. And it was almost like at the same time, we just kind of like looked at each other and we just kind of like, yo, we can do that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and like like literally right, so right at that moment, we left from the contest, went to my cousin crib. All, my mind, I told I'm like eight, nine years old. So all my friends were playing outside. Mm -hmm. 
me and my homie, we went inside the crib, we sat down, and we wrote. We wrote our first raps together. Mm -hmm. Came outside, spit our raps. I was stealing lines of my raps. <laughs> 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 uh, what I say, uh, what I say in the, 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 the rap, I don't remember the whole thing. I know I stole some of the biggest shit, though. I know I, I, know <laughs> I said, uh, uh, girls used to diss me and now they want to kiss me. I said that. Uh, I said something about yabba dabba do like Fred Flintstone. It was so trash. <laughs> I don't remember the whole thing, but I just know it was so trash. And like, so we came out, we, we, we uh, was kicking our raps. You know, our friends, they was laughing at us and the whole nine and shit like that. But that's where it started at as far as with the rapping. And, mm. you know, obviously years go by, I get older. And um, so real quick, now we're talking about the RJ Payne situation, right? Mm. Um, kind of skipping ahead like uh, by a lot of years. So when mm. me and RJ Payne first came in the game, we was a group. We was a rap group. Ah, and both nice. of us rapped. And but I I, I made the beats in almost like Mom Deep. Right. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. yeah, I made the beats and I rapped, and then he rapped and came up with concepts mm. and stuff like that. And the name of our group was Rhyme and Reason. Mm. And um I don't know, it's just like I feel like the more we started to work and put out projects, I just developed more of a love for producing other people. Mm. Mm. Because I yeah. noticed how much more I noticed how much more I guess I would say joy that I would get from that, you know. And he'll yeah. still be like to this day, like, "Come on, man, you need to come back. Like, let these people know how nice you are. You need to come back rapping." And I, I, I was just like, "Man, listen, I'm doing what I like to do. Like, this is yeah. I'm really enjoying myself doing the producing thing. You know what I mean? But I, um, so to kind of go back, like I said, I, you know, I was rapping with my homies. And you know, I got older and got in like got in like high school, and I had like a big group. It was almost like pretty much like Wu Tang Clan. It was a bunch mm -hmm. of us, and I was the producer of a group of like twelve people. And then we even had an R and B group. My dad was our manager, and we had like an R and B group. So I had to produce the uh, the music for the R and B group. It was three females in the group. Then I had two cousins that had moved up from Memphis, so I had to produce Memphis-style beats. Now you're going to understand where the versatility came from. So right. I had to produce Memphis-style beats. Then I had a cousin that was, like, from, from Michigan, and so he had a different sound. So it was, like, a group, a bunch of us. Mm -hmm. And my brother, like, my brother, brother, he's, like, 10 months younger than me, he was, like, super East Coast. Mm. So I'm producing that. You know what I mean? So it was, like, that's crazy. And I, so you yeah, and I'm like super and young. You go East Coast, you go R and B, all in one place. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm the backbone mm. of this in the studio, and I'm and everybody like was walking around to be waiting in the studio waiting for me to produce their track. Wow, man. And amazing. so that's how I started. But I was rapping as well. Then we would do shows. We had we had videos on. Uh, I mean, commercials on MTV. We had our CDs in the store. Like my pops was like really. Sirius was putting money behind us. And then, like, what ended up happening was um, I ended up going to prison. Okay. And, yeah, I did something dumb. I robbed a store, me and my friend. The same, the same one that we st I started rapping with. <laughs> you know, we did something dumb. We teenagers or whatever. Uh, eight, I don't think I was, like, 18, 19, something. Like that. But, you know, I robbed the store. Ended up having to do two years in prison. And okay. by the time I by the time I got out, it was like everything fell apart. Mm. And I at the time I didn't even like when I was in it, and I was like before I went to prison and all that, I didn't realize how important of a role that I played. I really didn't. And then when I got out, like everybody was just like, "Yeah, when you when you got locked up, you know, just you was know, the backbone of it, and everything just fell apart. And people started doing different things. They ended up in jail or." just didn't have a passion for it no more. And I was just kind of like, man, that's crazy. And so as I, I had to put everything on my back, you know, so I started rapping and producing. I just try to keep going with it, you know? Mm. Yeah. So that's basically like if Manny Fresh went to jail when the Hot Boys were, right. were coming up. Like imagine if right. that happened, like what would have happened? Because he was literally right. the only guy who was making beats and doing all that. Because it was like when I got locked up, <clears throat> My cousin from Memphis, like he knew how to how to produce. Um, 
he was actually the one that taught me how to like play like my the, my first real bass line he taught mm. me how to play and uh, my dad, he, my dad obviously knew how to produce too. And he was trying to produce the beats and it just wasn't the same. And it was like, speaking of learning how to play, like I actually learned, uh, when I, when I actually got good at producing, it was cause my, my pops had took me and my brothers and my friends and the whole group that I was in took us to, to Memphis yeah. for like a week. And he called some of his old uh, bandmates and this had us like in this hotel or whatever like that. And we was recording songs. But the bandmates, they was like teaching me, teaching me music theory, teaching me a bunch of stuff while I was there. And I actually really learned how to play the keyboard and the bass line from uh, some of the instrumentalists that did work with uh, A-Ball and MJG. Oh, and a lot of that older okay. stuff. And, so I'm, and at the time, I'm not realizing who these people is. And so afterwards, that's when my dad told me. And then and then they and then uh one of them pulled my dad to the side and was just like, listen, you got a lot of talent in this room right now. But he was like, he pointed at me, he said, but that one right there, keep your eye on him because he's gonna be the one. Mm-hmm. And it was wow. like what a fast forward, Yeah, fast forward yeah. years later, it ended up happening like that. That's amazing, man. Wow. For real. Favorite, my favorite duos, they pulled an MJG because when you listen mm-hmm. to their music, a lot of their production, it sounds like it was done by a live band. It doesn't. It sound, was. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It wasn't like uh, a lot of music now sounds like it was made on a computer, as it is. But when right. you listen yeah. to a lot of their production, like T Mix, he's one of my favorite producers. Right. And you could hear him like playing those those bass, those keys. Like you can actually feel like he was playing. Yeah, because you know it was down south, man. That's you know. That's what I'm saying, oh, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of the instrumentation and stuff was going on down there, you know. Right. Like eight ball and MJG, my family, they all they knew them. You know what I mean? Like same with three six mafia, you know what I mean? Like they knew, like I don't know how true it is, because I ain't never got no test or nothing, but I guess supposedly Juicy J and Project Pat is my cousin. Ah, this okay. is what people in my family from Memphis tell me, but I don't, I can't contest to it. But this is just what my family in Memphis tell me that they're that we're related to them. And one of my yeah, older you brothers, get them on a, you need to get them on a track, man. That would be crazy. And it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be. Good, but that'll be that'll be sick. Yeah, I love to do something like that. that's. That's like as far as uh, production goes. That's where like a lot of my my earlier influence came from. That too, because uh, I felt like, and I know it's not a question, but I felt like um, Three Six Mafia. They were. If my memory serves me correct, I feel like they popularized popularized the uh, soul sampling in southern beats. Mm. Right. Okay. Mm. Like chopping soul sample. Like that. And don't get me wrong; it was soul samples or songs that was replayed. I know you but, mean the way but, that they chopped it. Yeah, they was chopping mm. them drums, yeah. like almost like an East Coast person would, but they was doing yeah, it in they put that southern. Way. They put that kind of southern sauce on it, so it wasn't right. the same it was coming from the East Coast. Right. And you listen to it, you're like, that shit is dark, but it's soulful as fuck. But it's soulful, okay, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, no. for real. Mm. Big point. Hey, what, what you got next, bro? Yeah, man. So I mean, listening to you speak, we speaking before just about your strengths as well in in being versatile and things like that. I was going to ask you as a producer and as an artist, what do you feel your strengths and weaknesses are? If you feel like, you know, you're just being varied with your sound and your style is a strength, great. What would you say are some of your weaknesses uh, as an artist, your strengths and weaknesses as a, in your opinion? Um, <laughs> so... My strength, I feel like this. I'm I'm really good with um, working with people. You know, I'm good with dealing with all types because, like, what, I've worked with so many artists and it's different mm-hmm. personalities. Sometimes I got to be a counselor. Sometimes <laughs> I gotta, you know, what I mean, like, it's it's, it's 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 so much that comes to it. People be dealing with things in life, and you know, I'm just I'm good at working with people and communicating mm-hmm. with people. And just being able to adapt and be versatile in each situation, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like this particular project and working with this person might be a completely different workflow than dealing with this next person. You know. Um, Let me ask you a question on that. Have you ever had to be a motivator? And I ask that question because 
I've been around a few artists in my time and all that. And I've seen people have to literally motivate an artist to get up and record a song. Now, whether that be that they didn't care for it or they just weren't in the mood that day, but it had to be done by a deadline, that kind of stuff. I'm sure you've had to do that a couple of times. Man. Um, so, sometimes. Sometimes it happened like that. But I will say um, I was like that for pain. Okay. Okay. In the beginning. And when I when I want to say that is like not not that he didn't work or nothing, but it was like, and I'm talking about our earlier, earlier stages mm. where before he was when he was still Rain Man. Right. Right. Yeah. Before mm. he changed his name. And we was trying like we I'm talking about we was having trouble even getting people to even repost our music. Mm. You know what I mean? And it was like it got to the point where he I remember he told me, he mentioned this too, I believe, in one of his interviews, but I remember he told me, like, man, you know what? I think I'm good, man. I think I'm cool working this job mm -hmm. that I'm working at. I think he's working at Target at the time. Like, man, I'm cool. Yeah. I'm just working this mm -hmm. job right now, and I'm going to just do that. And I, this music is just, yeah, nah, I think I'm, I'm going to fall back. And I'm telling him, I'm like, listen, bro, you tripping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what we got right now, all, all I'm telling him, I said, listen, all it takes is the right person to hear mm -hmm. what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna take off. I'm like, just trust me. Like, let's just stick with it. And that would be a thing that I would I would tell him, like, yo, we just gotta stick with this music, man. And there was times, like I said, that he would just kind of like, like, yeah, nah, I don't know if it's gonna ever pay off. Mm. So and look at it now. Yeah, exactly, now look man. now. And we chip about that, you know what I mean? Like now, I'm like, man, I'm like, bro, I'm so happy that you listened to me and didn't <laughs> give up. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, yeah. you, now is you are where. I seen him be, you know what I mean? Mm. Like I just knew it just took it just yeah. took the right person to hear him. That's a big yeah. thing what you said though, man. You can't overlook that because you're saying, you know, being good working with people. We as recipients, man, as the consumers, we only hear and see the end product. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. We don't see all the work that goes on in the background. But you can't you do hear stories sometimes of artists or producers saying so and so was a nightmare to work with, or you know what I mean, they got this attitude and they got that. So if you've got that quality about you where you're good with people and you can bring the best out of them, that's something to be proud of, man, definitely. I've, had, have I've, well. I've had artists that was, mm. I guess you could say, that would be considered a nightmare to work with if it was like other mm. people. But my patience is different. You know what right. I mean? Like I feel like mm. the music is more important than somebody having a... Can I curse? Yeah. Yeah, man. Do your it, thing, bro. I feel, I feel like the music, getting the music is done, music done, is more important than worrying about somebody's shitty attitude. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I'm like, can you? You can rap good. I can make beats good. I can put this music together. Your attitude kind of sucks, but is it worth it? If I feel like the music is worth it, right? I'm mm. able to still deal with people. You know what I mean? Right. Because you know what's going to come at the end of it. I know. I know what's going to come from it. And then right. once it's yeah. done, we sit back and listen to it. Now I look at the artist like. Bro, this is what I was saying the whole time. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, you know? of course. Mm. Yeah, man. Producing yeah, man. is so much well, more than playing instruments, right? It's, exactly. there's, so much more, there's so much more that goes Bro. into it. Right, it's a soundtrack to the music, man. That's why production. We talk about this so often, but that's why. I mean, I love having MCs on. I'm a lyrical guy. I love lyrics, but I, I, I've got such a big appreciation for producers, man, because all the albums we speak about so much that we we hold in such high regard and classics, and we. The, the replay value and everything, not only is it the lyrics, it's the music that gives it the soul. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. the music that gives it the heart, man. So producers are so important to projects as much as them. Yeah. Sometimes even more. Do you know what I'm saying? Because that's what you're hearing. Sometimes it's the, it's the production that's making you go back to something. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it's important, man. So what do you say for weaknesses? Sorry, carry on. Um, if any, if any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like I have any. That's all good, man. That's all good. Is it all right for me that's to say? Good. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, man. I mean, I, it might good. be something. I just, I don't, I don't know. I think I work pretty hard on to get past whatever weaknesses I've had. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I feel like where I'm at now, this is like the phase of. Like, this is the Jordan phase for me right now. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's just not to sound too conceited, but at the same time, I don't think there's anything wrong with believing in ourselves. 
Man, this is hip hop culture, man. If we don't believe in ourselves, then who is? Do you know what I mean? So, right. Because I like I'm a real like I'm a realist. Don't get me wrong. I remember when I was whack. Y'all right. didn't get a chance to hear that, but <laughs> I remember when I was whack. You know what I'm saying? I know, like I know, uh, like if I'm not doing something at my best potential, but I work like really, 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 really hard to put out mm -hmm. the best music. I can possibly put out. Mm, yeah. You know, like even, you know, when we speaking about the uh, production thing, um, and you, you mentioned like the consumers just hearing the product mm, and mm. don't know behind, you know what I'm saying? Like what goes on behind. Some of this music that y'all hear that I produced, those wasn't even the original beats to the song. Man. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, like, That's crazy. A lot of the music that y'all hear that I've produced, it would be like, you know, I'll hear this like, I'll, okay, boom, I might send a beat to the artist <clears throat> and they'll send some vocals back and the vocals aren't whack. I just feel like the beat isn't doing the vocals justice. Right, right, right. Even if, mm -hmm. even if, even if it's like, hey, I kind of expected the rapper to go a different direction on this beat. They didn't mm -hmm. do that. So, okay, now let me cater to the direction they went. Right. So I'm going to scrap this beat, and I'm going to produce a completely different beat up under it. And by the time they hear the version of it, and it's like, oh, my, yo, this sounds so mm -hmm. much better. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think that's, like, uh, important as far as, like, being a, a, a good producer. You know, because yeah. obviously, you know, there's a difference between being a beat maker and a producer. Definitely. Right. You exactly. know, and, and a lot of people, exactly. they don't know that. So they think everybody that makes a beat is a, is a producer, which right. is, isn't mm -hmm. true. You know right. what I mean? And so I pride myself on being both. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a beat maker and I'm a producer. Dope. Because we've got a lot of beat makers in hip hop now, right? But we don't. Yeah, know a lot of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? A lot of them. But see, that's the thing is like also... You know, with me is when I'm working on the album, I'm trying to produce a world for this particular artist. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to the next album, I'm trying to produce a separate world for their artists right. versus, let's say, just a beat maker. All the albums going to sound the same. Every album right. that has beats from this particular person, they're going to sound the same. Right. Because they're, even if even if they don't even if they have a particular style, like not to toot my own horn too much, but like let's say if I if I produce an album with like a bunch of soul samples, right? For one artist, yeah. when I go and if I do an album for another artist, and let's say I decide to use soul samples for that, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to make it sound different yeah. than mm -hmm. what I did on the last um, the last. The previous album, you know what I'm saying? So I pride myself on trying to do that. You know what I mean? Trying to give each artist their own vibe when I'm creating with them, because I know that's very uh, important when it comes to the production. That's dope. That's and hearing what you said about hearing vocals that you think, mm, that doesn't quite fit. I'm going to do this. It reminds me of hearing Wu talking about Triumph. When, they, when RZA first played the beat, it didn't sound anything like what we heard right. in the final version. So he was just right. like, just, just give me, just record, just record. I can't remember who it was. It might have been Deck actually. One of them mm. was saying we were just recording our verses, and we heard like the skeleton. Yeah, that was Deck. Yeah, it might have been him. Mm. And then it was he, like, he told me, he told me the same story. Yeah, because it was like we went in the studio, we heard the skeleton, it was like, eh, I, I don't know where he's going with this. So he was like, don't worry, trust me, just record, and I'm gonna sort it out. Yeah, you know, and it's it's funny. In the studio, and they heard the finished version, and they went crazy, like what right, is this man done. So you yeah. know, funny thing about that is that's something I I kind of I say what I got from RZA. I got that from RZA and Kanye. Right. Okay. Because mm. those are like my two favorite producers of all time, like Kanye and RZA. Oh, Kanye and RZA <laughs> and Quincy yeah, Jones. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So I got that. And then, so we talking about real quick. We talked about. Uh, a sound. Mm. So my earlier sound was that it was soul sample chops. Mm. Right. Mm. You know, that was my earlier sound. You know what I mean? But I didn't want to mm. just do that, you know? Yeah, because that can put you in a box real quick. And plus, a lot mm. of people do that now. 
Right, exactly. Like I Everyone's like, just like let me find a soul sample. No, no one's like, let me go find an obscure Russian music sample. Yeah, a, like, I like I song. like doing it was when it wasn't so like oversaturated. Mm, yeah, of course. Yep. It's like when Daz Effects were doing the wiggity, no one was doing it, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, exactly. they started doing it, and then everybody, yeah, but then it just became like, all right, now we gotta get it played out. And then, but, you see, but you see what I'm saying, though? Now that kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier. When you have that one thing, all it takes is for somebody else to figure out how to do that, right. and then now you kind of get you like, don't need to get mm, exactly, facts, hundred mm. percent. So, um. How would you describe? Because I remember listening to Havoc one time talking about how he makes beats, and he said, For me, I see things in colors. So he'll be like, If I play in a bass line, that's one color, and then I have a melody, that's another color, and then a sample, that's another color. And then when I put all the colors together, I hear that the whole picture. Um, right. hearing him say that, I was like, That's that's a really dope way of describing it. So, if someone was to say to you, like, What is your creative process? How would you describe it? Like, how do you put all these elements together to make what you want? Uh, for me, it's it's literally, like, as funny as it's going to sound, it's a feeling that I get in the middle of my chest. That's like me when I listen to Dilla music. That's it, exactly Dilla, that's, that's another, I'm, man, how do I leave him out? That's another one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. It's Dilla, and he inspired me a lot of my earlier production, too. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's, it's a feeling... Um, and that kind of goes into me producing these albums. It's like if I'm working on something and I don't get that feeling in like my middle of my chest, you know, it's not right. It's not right. And yeah. I might, I might be sitting there and I'll listen to it maybe for like three hours, just sitting there. And I'm like, yo, it's just something like this is good, but I'm not looking for good. I'm looking for great. Mm -hmm. And once I get right. great, I get that feeling right here in the middle of my chest. And so that's usually like, like even when I hear a sample. Sometimes before I even make a beat, I might hear yeah. the sample and I'll, rip, I'll mm -hmm. get that feeling because I know what I'm about to do with it. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. And all I got to mm -hmm. do now is just sit down and take what's in my head and just put it in my machines and stuff, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's dope, man. But yeah, I, I produce based on, like, feeling, you know? Yeah. And that's why I was saying before, off air, um, I was saying to PA how his music, uh, he's just elevated every time I've heard projects from him. And Definitely. of that is down to the feeling that the music yeah. gives me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I can listen to a lot of music and be like, yeah, that's cool. But if it doesn't give me the feeling, I don't care if I never hear it again. Do you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I need to, like, I was driving the other day with my girl in the car and uh, a Dilla song came on. And I just had goosebumps on my arm just because, like, that whole feeling of just me and my girl in the car, this song, she even knew the words to it, which was super dope. But mm. just that music just gives you that feeling of this is, like, he put his soul into this. Right, I mean that you just don't get yeah. from every producer. You just right, don't. right, and it's like when you when you when you do music uh, based on feeling, it kind of makes it kind of like timeless. You know what I'm saying? Because it's right. like there's always going to be something exactly. that like mm. yeah, like something that makes you like want to go back to it because you want to experience that feeling again. You know, facts. Mm -hmm. Very true, yeah, man. That's dope. So that, that leads me into a nice question I was thinking of, actually. When you're speaking about your creative um, process and the feeling you have, and if you don't have that feeling, you're thinking, ah, it's good. But like you said, you don't just want good. So what would you say is the work that you're the most proud of? It can either be a, a beat that you produced, like your favorite beat or a project that you produced. Like, what are you most proud of? Like, what's your baby, if you had to choose? Good question. Only get one. <laughs> give, give us oh. a top three if, if yeah, you've got that yeah. go for a top three give okay top three obviously an inspector deck album mm. and okay can you guys oh. remember this question real quick because i just want to say something yeah yeah so and, and this is another reason why with the inspector deck album is so important to me because the way like the the the, the trust that he had in me with it mm. you know mm. almost it was like how when he worked with rizza and it was just like, he was like, no, I'm going I'm to I'm record these verses and things like that. And I'm just, you get everything and like, just put together the best project we can put together. And I'm going to follow the lead of you. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, yo, hold up. Inspector Dexon, you going to follow the lead of me? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. So he allowed me 
to really produce the album. Like sometimes when we're working with certain artists, there's nothing wrong because he had ideas too and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with uh, artists having ideas, but sometimes they tend to try to produce the producer. And it's right. like, well, what am I? What am I doing here? If you're gonna tell me yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. right? You know. So, um, and he thanked me. He said, you know, he thanked me for you know giving him his best project. And so, you know, that's definitely one of the ones that I'm just probably like the most proud of. Mm, um, that's exciting. That's dope, man. Especially you must, have under, you must have must have been under a little bit of pressure on yourself to be like, this is this. I have to give him the best possible yeah. pressure I can. Yeah. Do. You know, I was, it's, it's funny because as far as the pressure, I was uh, in the beginning, I'm trying to get this light correct. <laughs> I was <laughs> more in the beginning and then I, and I even told him, I was just like, man, I'm like, bro, you don't understand, like, yo, y'all are my heroes. Right, mm. exactly. Like, Wu-Tang, that's my favorite rap group of all times. Like, I patterned myself after them, as I told you earlier, with my group that I was growing up with and stuff like that. And I was just like, man. So I kind of told him that. He was like, man, like, listen, I'm doing this project with you because of what you do. Mm. Mm. Just do what you do all the time. Yeah, that's not I'm like, he's like, yeah, don't try to, like, keep up with RZA, because if I wanted that, I'll go get beats from RZA. Right. Of course. Mm. Yeah, he said, I'm I'm doing this project with you because of what you do. And um, and that kind of like, I'm like, all right, cool. You know what I mean? And then like, as I'm starting to put these songs together and was getting his reaction from it, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, so he really rocked with what I'm, what, what I'm doing. And so after a while, it just became like working with the homie. You know what I mean? Like we already got, we like two or three songs in on another project. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Then, mm. And then I got, like, we got a lot of work together. A mm. lot. That has, you know, obviously hasn't came out yet, but we got a lot of work together and, and plan on to have much more, you know? Like he, he right. said, um, That's exciting, man. he said in an interview recently, he said, man, I wouldn't mind if P.A. Dre produced all the rest of my music from me. <laughs> you know, my solo music from here on out. I was like, man, that's crazy. But so I the answer to the question, that see. that album, definitely. Um, let me see. I want to say there's so many different pain albums that I'm like really proud of. But I would say uh if cocaine could talk seven. I knew you was like, going to go for one of those. I wanted to hear that, bro. I wanted to yeah, hear that. I was waiting for you to say what it is, mm. man. Yeah. Cool. Cocaine Can Talk 7, the one we did with Ice-T. Right. Yeah. That, mm. I would say I would say the Inspector Deck album, the Cocaine Can Talk 7. Um, And then it's a tie, if I'm allowed to have a tie. It's a tie yeah, between, <laughs> it's a tie between Pillmatic and the caution tape that I did with Mav. Okay, I haven't heard that one yet. I'm gonna have to get to that. Mm. Okay, all right. Yeah. This one right here. All right, I have right. to get to that. Yeah, this mm. it's a masterpiece, man. And so I would say that me, Those me, all the time, man. How much we love that, uh, the cocaine series, man. Like, all the we, time we talk about that. You can play those albums, like most of them, you can play back to front, and you're like, oh, yeah. damn, it's finished already. And you, right? Go back oh, yeah, 100%. Man. 100%. I remember, um, not too long ago, I had a week off work and I was going to gym every morning, like before I started my day, I went to the gym every morning, and so I said, you know what, for every morning, I'm going to listen to the whole If Cocaine Could Talk series again. Like probably for I couldn't tell you how many times I've listened to it. So many already. So every day I was just listening to one day two. I was listening to Cocaine Could Talk two. You know what I mean? And it's just it just gets better each time. And I watched New Jack City again recently, and then I watched part seven. Listen to part seven again straight after. Incredible work, man. Seriously, Thank incredible work. Thank you. Seriously. Yeah, that's mm. de that's definitely like I would say one of my favorite. I got another mm. album. Um. That I'm finished is like a passion project, I would say. That is definitely like probably the one of the most important projects I've ever done because it's something that I've wanted to do for a long okay. time. 
and it's um with the artist uh Akil Ali. And Akil Ali. Yeah, Akil Ali. And okay. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Wine X. No. no. Okay, they're from Buffalo. Okay, and um okay. So anyways, the album, like I've always like I love Nina Simone. Like that's like one of my top favorite singers of all time. Mm. Like I love her music. And I was I always wanted to do an album was just nothing but sampling her music. Mm. Hey, I like where this is going. But yeah. I but I had I felt like I needed the right artist to do that with. Like I needed an artist that understands the importance of her music and her music being important to, to them as much as it is to me. Yeah. Um and so I you know, I tweeted one day how I had this project that I want to do. I didn't say what project it was or the idea, but I know people like to bite. And then I, they I like, they didn't want to thought or some shit. <laughs> so, but I just, I just said, I'm like, you know, I got this album, man. I really, really been wanting to do, um, but I just need like the right artist to do the, to do the project with, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I killed, reached out to me because he had been wanting to work with me for a while. Funny thing about it is I haven't wanted to work with him as well, you know? And he reached out to me. He was just like, man, yo, just tell me whatever it is that you got going. I'd love to do a project with you. Whatever you, you know, whatever you're trying to do, I'm willing to follow your lead, X, Y, and Z, like that. So, uh, and there was a few other people, too, that reached out. And they were just like, just tell yeah. me what the idea is. And I'm just like, but, but if I don't do the idea with you, then what does that you mean? You can go through it with someone else. Right. Right. Exactly. Someone right. Mm. So I'm like, well... I already knew Akil had already wanted to work with me anyways. Mm. And I already wanted to work with him. So I told him the idea. He was like, man. Uh, oh, yeah, because he, he I think he's from, he's originally from Mount Vernon, New York. Okay. But he lives in Buffalo, too. He works for like Planet Asia and like a lot of other people. And, um, and so I told him the idea of the project. And I had already had two beats produced already. And because mm -hmm. uh, what I was gonna do originally, I was like, man, I'm just about to do a beat tape and just flip them, flip the samples, and just put it out as a beat tape like that. You know what I mean? So I had already had two beats. And I told him the idea that I had for the project, and um, he was with it. He was like, man, I love Nina Simone. He's like, bro, I studied her. I said, you studied mm -hmm. her? He's like, yeah. He's like, yo, she used to live in my town, and and so we just got into a conversation for like an hour of just about Nina Simone and how important her music is. I said, this is the right person to do this project. Right. It was meant to happen, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. So I said, bro, I'm going to send you one beat and let me see what you do with it. If it turns out right, yo, we on. I, I sent him the beat. He sent me back the song. I said, right, it's time to go to work. <laughs> and so we're done with this. We're just working on the outro now. But yo, I feel like um, because I was like, also, it was important to me that I know like some of her songs has been sampled a lot. Yeah, and yeah. so it was important to me to do them differently than I've ever heard them being done. Right. You know, that was very important to me to do them different than because I'm like, well, there's there's no point if somebody else already like did it like this. <clears throat> I don't want to do it that way. You know what I mean? So. I, I got like a really, really creative. So I would say, as far as production, as probably I'm probably like the, the most proud of this mm. album. Just like as far as if it's okay for me to use this word, but to 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 show uh, any amount of brilliance from me as a producer, I yeah, think this yeah. is it. I think this is this. Sh if if anyone is familiar with Nina Simone's music, mm. uh, and they hear this project. I did some things on there where people are going to wonder, like, yo, how did he do that? That's wow. what's missing. This is exactly yeah. what's missing. <laughs> because exactly. I was listening to uh, the song I was talking about with me and my girl. It was um, uh, Won't Do by Dilla, right? So, I love that song. Right. So you, you're listening to the beat, and then at the end, you hear the Isleys coming in with footsteps in the dark, right? Right. So, that song has been sampled a million times. Mm. It was never done the way Dilla did it. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know he I mean? did it differently. He did it different. And this yeah. is exactly why I'm getting bored of the way that producers are making music now 
because none of them are like like we've heard um people redo eight note. I heard Buster and um Coiler A doing that yeah. same thing. But it sounds exactly the same. Then right. I heard a, a remake of um Get You Home by uh Foxy Brown. But that yeah. was done by I think Lotto and someone else. But it sounds yeah, exactly no, that was that was done that was done by um Lola Brook. That oh Lola Brook mm. that's it, Lola, that's the one. Yeah. So I'm like, but you haven't changed it. You just basically repackaged it and sold it back right. to people. Right. So to hear you say, I don't want to do it the way everyone else has done it, man. That's exactly what is yeah, missing it's from the game. It's, game. Yeah. it's not enough. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to do what you've already done. I want to make this my own. Yeah, because it was like yeah. one of my one of my things, you know, as far as producing and like the producers that inspired me were people that like knots, for example. Mm. You know what I mean? Like he would like I'm like yo, nuts is crazy, man. <laughs> it's the thing that this baseline, this thing that he do with his baseline, mm-hmm. and I'm like, how the fuck do he do that? But the thing <laughs> is, the thing is this: I don't want to know. It's like you know how sometimes you think you want to know something, but right. you really don't want to know. You know what I mean? Because yeah. yeah. it's like keep I like mystery. Yeah, I yeah. like the mystery of like yo, n- nobody else. I've never heard anybody else do that with it with their bass lines. And the way right. he chop his samples, his drums is always crazy, crazy. but it's his bass lines that always have me like, yo, how does he do that? It's you no, know, it's funny because with Dilla, like he's he's known so much for sample chopping and stuff like mm-hmm. that. This is drums. One of the things that got his drums is crazy bass, too. One of the things that got me from Dilla was his bass lines. Insane. Mm-hmm. That player's baseline? Come on, man. That the player's baseline. The uh what's the chop call question? the evening. Yeah, yeah. The, the baseline way. on that. Like, bro. Mm. Like, come on, Definitely. man. Just, he was, it was like he was making the baseline talk in a way. Like exactly. You know, so yeah. some some certain things from, from producers is just you know, some producers might their drums might catch me, uh, the sample chopping might catch me. But then sometimes it's the, the way they play their bass lines. Mm. You know, when they doing something that makes you just just want to stop and be like, "Yo, how the fuck did they do that?" Dilla does that all the time to <laughs> yeah. me because I listen to yeah. like, it. Could be something small like I've heard that drum before, but I can't place it. And then you hear it later, you're like, "How did he take that? How did he do right? And make it dip like crazy? How did right? How did he do that?" Crazy, so yeah, that's dope. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you did with the, the Nina. Trust me, man. I can't wait for that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. I love the album, man. Like once it's done, once it's done, and you know, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna send it to y'all both personally. Just oh, see right, what y'all right. think yeah, of it. Man. You know. Thank mm. you, man. Please, please. Um, no problem. So, just talk to us a little bit about because people that would know you would know that uh, you work with RJ Payne. RJ Payne considers you his producer. You consider yourself as as a tag team, like a primo and guru or a right. Pete Rock and Seal Smooth. Right. Um, so it seems like Payne kind of got to a point where he was like, I'm tired of rapping about drugs and violence yeah. and mm-hmm. all of this kind of stuff. And he's kind of moved into a more kind of conceptual space with his with his albums. Mm-hmm. Right. Which I think which I think is dope. Um, and it seems to be really working for him, man. So just talk to us a little bit about how that came about and how that's worked out for you guys. So, you know, the funny thing about that is that's always, that was like, that's what we came in doing. Right. So these are like mixtapes I'm going to tell you about. I'm not sure if you heard them or not, but they're called the Ghost of series. Yeah, that was way before the cocaine series. But he yeah. Was doing, yeah. A rapper, so he was like the ghost of... Um, a Prodigy. Prodigy. Yeah, right. Yeah. We did the Ghost of Prodigy. We did the Ghost of Big. L. The Ghost of Big L was the first one. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah, even right. how that came about was how I thought of the idea was crazy. Um. Mm. So yeah, so we did those. You know what I mean? And that was our thing, like just doing concept based stuff. And then it was just like, you know, he was starting doing these freestyle videos, uh, Murder in sixty seconds on his mm. Instagram with him just rapping aggressively and stuff like that. And people started to gravitate towards it. And I remember him telling me, right, 
He going to kill me probably for repeating this. <laughs> but he said, man, he said, Dre, listen, I know you like to do the musical stuff. He said, but we might have to switch the lane for a little bit, man, because people, they, they, they liking this right here. And then we can come back to it. We just grab, we just grab the fan base. And then we can come back to doing what we love to do. So what we're doing right now is this is what we've always loved to do in the first place. But all the other stuff, the aggressive raps and all the other stuff, that was just to feed the fans that like that type of shit and the game of yeah. fan base. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's so like so like now, this is what we're doing now. It's easy. This is this is what we always have done, and this is what we always like to do, you know. Mm. That's good to hear, man. Yeah. That's very good to yeah. hear. Yeah. That's it saying. I'm gonna just hit you for probably another one question. Um, okay. So you said you're speaking for me personally. So you said you're speaking with uh, working with Deck, and you know you spoke about Wu being your favorite hip hop group of all time. So yeah. that's like working with a hero of yours, understandably. Um, who have you not worked with that would you love to? Who's on your ideal bucket list artist to work with? Oh man. Oh. Uh... You can list as many people as you want. Yeah, as many oh, as you want. Okay. Um, Earl Sweatshirt is definitely somebody okay. that I love to work with. That's like my favorite rapper right now, outside okay. of like Pain and some of the others. Mm -hmm. But um, and it's crazy because like a lot of people they don't even know that like I listen to like a lot of stuff like Earl Sweatshirt, uh, Mike, uh, like Wiki, like you know Maxo, like a lot of these type of people they probably don't even think that I listen to that type of music, but mm. like Earl Sweatshirt is definitely somebody I like to work with. Um let me see who I Rock Marciano, that's another one of my favorites. Mm. I love to work with him if I had the opportunity. I want to say Jay Z and Nas, but that's like the that's the go-to. Who wouldn't say that? You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah who wouldn't say that? Uh Michael Jackson obviously who wouldn't say that? Um I'm trying to think, man. Snoop Dogg. Okay. Mm. The Snoop Dogg. That was like my original first favorite rapper. Yeah. I think it was a lot of people, to be honest. Snoop Dogg. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. It's, I know I'm missing some people, man. Uh, I, know I'm, I know I'm missing some people. I still got to get one with Ghostface. Oh, that... I got to. Fine. It's 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 in talks of a record with, with Ghostface. Um, but I, I definitely got to get one with him. I know he likes he like my beats, so I'm just like, well, Ooh. okay, well, let's make something happen. <laughs> you know, if that happens right there. What'd you say? If that happens right there, man, that will be something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I I believe it's gonna happen, man. I just gotta wait it out. You know what I mean? It's definitely going. I'm, it's a few things that's kind of like in the works that I can't really necessarily speak about at the moment. I just gotta make sure they happen first right. before I can yeah. uh, say yeah. anything about it. You know what I mean? Right, mm. man. That's so I'm, I'm that's just saying, man. We've, we've kind of we've kind of hit our hour, man. I could literally go on for another hour easily. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we might, we might have to bring this back, man. We might have to get PA on another episode, man, because it's been so dope um, to get mm. the info. Um, the dude is so talented. If you haven't checked out his stuff, then I implore all of you. We're going to put some links below for some of his, his bits, his projects that he's working on that he sent to us. Um, and if anything is popping up, I'll, I'll follow him. He follows me. And um, I'll always promote his stuff, man, because it's dope. And I don't just promote anybody's stuff. I really just rock with the people that I rock with. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, man, just thank you so much for coming on the show. We're definitely going to invite you back on because there's so much more. Um, yeah, it was a lot of stuff that I didn't even get a chance to get into. Yeah, for real. Right? There's, there's just so much more we could have got into, man. But we like to try and keep it out around the hour mark because, you know, people's attention spans in 2023 is about the, you know, the size of a fly. So we try, right. we, try, we try and keep it good size as we can. But we're definitely going to have PA back on, man, because there's just so much more that we could delve into. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to uh, sign off, but uh, we'll definitely re revisit this one for sure, hundred yeah. percent. Thank so, you for uh, having me on here. No nah, man, thank, nah, thank, you for pleasure, us, man. thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, so mm. for me, man, I'm gonna sign out and say we're gonna come back to this, man. So check it out. 
check out PA Dre, check out the RJ Payne stuff, check out the, the whole Cocaine Could Talk series, um, My Life is a Movie series. There's just so mm. much stuff to, to dig into. PA's own album, Pillmatic, uh, which is so, so dope, um, where he's got a bunch of artists on there, all, all produced by him. So check out his stuff and let us know what you think. Um, so yeah, we'll sign out. Me, your boy Slack, my co-host extraordinaire on my left. Yes, yes, yes. It's been a good one, man. Like Slack said, we could have talked easily more on and on and on, man. PJ, appreciate you joining us, man. Appreciate you just taking the time out of your day as well and speaking of us, man. It means a lot to us. And like Slack said, we don't, we're fans of your music, man. Do you know what I'm saying? We're not just having you on for something to do, man. We appreciate your music and what you're doing for the industry and what you're doing for the culture, man. It means a lot. Thanks, I definitely appreciate it. Definitely, man. So, yeah, we'll try and make it happen again. So, yes. My type of hype, the podcast that celebrates hip hop or not just the hype. Thank you for joining us again. Until next week, stay blessed and keep it hype. Peace. Peace. Peace.